The subcontinent of China has always held a fascination for Western eyes. Its sights leave indelible impressions. For 10 years after the communists took power, Western eyes were fed a new set of images. This is the communist 10th anniversary celebration. Since 1959, this is what Western eyes have been allowed to see. Filtering out have been rumors of famine, breakdown, revolt. In the past 20 months, only one non-communist Western journalist had inside with a film camera. This is the man. His name is Fernand Gigon. He is Swiss. This program is about what has been happening inside China. What is happening inside China today? not recognize communist China. Officially, we have no relations with it. Nevertheless, it exists. We have met its armies in Korea, its agents in Southeast Asia, its diplomats in Geneva and Warsaw. But for 12 years, its borders have been closed to us. For 20 months, they have been closed to the non-communist world. It is clear that during this period, vast changes have taken place in China. Our lack of information has led to much speculation. This is an attempt to pierce the wall of secrecy, to piece together the facts. This is communist China, population 700 million. The island of Formosa, nationalist China, population 11 million. The British crown colony of Hong Kong. If you want to know what's going on inside China, this is a good place to start. Hong Kong could be compared to a huge radar. Its critical focus, China. Into Hong Kong every day are railroads coming from the mainland of China that are filled with passengers. Now many of these people are carefully interrogated by the many specialists in Hong Kong, Americans, English, and from other Asian countries. And out of this probably comes the most concrete and concise information on what is going on in China today. This report is based on nine months of investigation by NBC News, talking to experts, refugees, diplomats around the world. This report also turned up the one Western journalist who had been inside China with a film camera during this period. In September 1961, Fernand Gigon came to Hong Kong from China. He had gone in in June. He had been inside for three months. It was the second time for him. It was in 1956 when I visited first communist China. She only personally granted me when I think you see I buttonholed him at Bandung's conference, in Indonesia. It was in 1955, yes. And now, you have heard my terrific French accent, and uh, I believe it's enough. Through an interpreter, it will be easier for me, and certainly for you. Les autorités de Pékin n'étaient pas enchantées de me revoir. The Chinese were not particularly eager to see me come back, but my embassy in Peking had issued almost 200 visas to Chinese diplomats, journalists, and interpreters. They were going to the Laos conference in Geneva, and I was the beneficiary of that fact. Hence, I got one of the few visas that had been issued lately at all. But no one can, within three months, grasp the full sweep of a great country, especially if one cannot see everything one wants to see, owing to the tissue of restrictions and prohibitions. But life in towns and villages reveals itself to you in the streets. It's like an open book. All you have to do is turn the pages and make your judgment. On June 26th, I went to Lo Wu by train. That's 22 miles from Hong Kong. The railway station teemed with Chinese. I was the only European around. For a foreigner, 
Entering China is the same as plunging into a dark tunnel. Right off the bat, the foreigner is isolated in a special railway car. Not one Chinese will speak to him, and this was not the same in 1956. China has withdrawn into herself. To understand the China Zhigong was about to see, you need to know what had happened in the last 15 years. 1946, Yan'an, 1,000 miles north of Hong Kong. The communists are holed up here in these caves, where they have been driven by Jiang Kai-shek. During the war with Japan, there has been an uneasy truce. Now the name of Mao Zedong appears prominently for the first time in news dispatches. Bloody civil war begins again. A peasant army, hardened by 20 years of guerrilla fighting, strikes at the cities held by the nationalists. War has become part of Jiang's life. He has been fighting the communists since 1924. A generation in China has grown up knowing little but war. Millions have been displaced or died. Before the fighting ends, more will be displaced or die. Shanghai. On both sides, the war is fought savagely, without quarter. Executions are commonplace. Killing goes on for four bloody years. By 1949, the nationalists are beaten. Jiang's army, carrying the traditional umbrellas of Chinese armies, retreats to Formosa. Many of his supporters follow. Thousands caught in the middle flee to Hong Kong. Left behind is a nation in chaos. Left behind a few of those who have lived well through all the bad times. Their money is now almost worthless. What one Chinese dollar would buy in 1939, it takes eight million to buy in 1949. Banks close. Life savings are lost. Mobs storm through the streets of the cities. Everywhere the wreckage of war is visible. Devastation and disorder. What industry and housing China had is now in ruins. China's main heavy industry, built by the Japanese in Manchuria, has been stripped of $2 billion worth of equipment by the Russians. The land is producing less than it did before the war with Japan. and it must feed 15 million more people every year. October 1st, 1949. The war is over. The communists take over China. For the first time since 1911, China has a central government effectively able to control the whole country. The communists promise China will be a great power again. Mao arrives in Peking. He has been a revolutionary for 28 years. This is the day he has been preparing for. Behind him is a tough army under rigid political control. Now he can begin remaking China. Moscow, December 16, 1949. Mao comes for help to his old Soviet comrades. He is a classic Marxist. He believes China can be powerful only if China has heavy industry. He wants Soviet money, Soviet machines, Soviet technicians. He is a guest in Moscow for nine weeks. February 4th, 1950. A 30-year friendship treaty is signed. Zhou Enlai signs for China, Molotov for Russia. China gets a $300 million loan. Later will come machinery and advisors. Among those present, Stalin, Mikoyan, Khrushchev. On his way back to Peking, Mao crosses a country where 80% of the people are peasants. 
Many of them have never seen a machine more complicated than a wooden plow. This is his raw material. 500 million peasants, patient, enduring, obedient, still calling themselves the central people, believing anyone who is not Chinese is a barbarian. From their labor, Mao intends to squeeze the food to feed China, the capital to buy machines to industrialize China. They are to bear the cost of trying to make China great again. The campaign for their minds begins to organize, mobilize, convert the largest population on Earth by persuasion or intimidation or force to a new way of thinking. They portray Uncle Sam as their arch enemy. There are appeals to their pride, their nationalism, their hatreds. Campaigns against imperialists, counter-revolutionaries, flies. Some who resist are killed, some kill themselves. Thousands go to prison to undergo thought reform, brainwashing, to confess their sins, to accept the communist dogma. In the villages, peasant associations are formed, guided by the party organizers. At what are called speak bitterness meetings, grievances pent up during past years are aired. Landlords are denounced. The land is confiscated and given to the peasants. Rents are abolished. Landlords are killed, flee, or go to prison. The peasants are promised the land belongs to them from this time on. Harvest 1952. The peasants have had three years of communist rule. Century-old ways remain. But now they own their own land. Agricultural production is the highest in 16 years. In the war-blasted cities, reconstruction begins by hand. Many factories are rebuilt. Few houses. Many owners and managers flee. But in 1952, production in some industries is 25% above pre-war levels. By 1952, the first goals of the revolution have been reached. The people have been mobilized. Opposition has been crushed. The war in Korea has united the country behind the communists. They play on old fears of imperialism, old pride of nationalism. America, the great white Western power, has been fought to a stalemate. The communists boast of keeping their promise to make China a power again. They announce a five-year plan. Aim to build heavy industry. Price, wood, and bricks are to be used to build factories, not houses. Labor to build roads, to produce more, to consume less. Hands and wooden tools to do the job of machines which they don't have. The people to work in labor battalions. Everyone, clerks, intellectuals, teachers to work. Everyone to do some manual labor. Steel to go to make more blast furnaces, not cars or kitchen stoves. After a day of this, they are expected to attend political indoctrination meetings, to confess their errors, to criticize themselves. In return, the communists hold up the promise of a future when their lives will be better. Workers swarm over the countryside like ants. They build irrigation ditches, canals, dams. They use what materials they have. Some of the things they build work. Some fall apart when they are tested. They start a road through impassable mountains to Tibet.
They have no heavy machinery. They have only their hands, their picks, their shovels, their energy, their endurance, their numbers. They are told the road is impossible to build. They build it. From the Soviet Union come technicians with blueprints and directions. Over the Trans-Siberian Railroad come whole factories to be assembled. In time, 211 factories. The Soviet technicians teach the Chinese to operate the machines. Later, they complain that the Chinese have no respect for the machines. They push them too hard, burn them out. The Chinese who have been instructed become instructors. They teach other Chinese. They teach girls. They teach schoolboys. They teach peasants who have never before been inside a factory. One point of friction begins to appear. The Soviet factories and technicians are not gifts. The Chinese are expected to pay for them. Despite the frictions, by 1955, steel production has been doubled. Coal production is up 50%, iron 100%. Almost no underdeveloped nation in history has industrialized at such a pace. At a price. The price is in what can be squeezed out of the people, especially the peasants. What machines they have are made of wood, devised ingeniously to take advantage of the only kind of power they have on most farms, manpower. It is 1955. A new order comes from Peking. The farms are to be collectivized. They are to be taken away from the peasants despite the promises of only three years ago. Now the peasants will work together on the collectives. What they produce will belong to the collectives. They will be paid according to their work. Harvest, 1955, the best crops in a decade. Resistance to the collectives crumbles. Within a year, the peasants are 96% collectivized. The communists point out proudly that it has been accomplished more quickly with far less bloodshed than in the Soviet Union. It is a moment of triumph for the communists. The new way seems to work. The proud future the communists have promised does not seem far off. 1956, nature turns on the people of China as it has for centuries. Thousands of tons of grain are lost. People are homeless, hungry. The people salvage what they can. This is a rice crop. The communists learn nothing much has really changed. They're not yet able to control nature. Their industrial advances still depend on the harvest. The harvest still depends on nature. In 1956, the Chinese communists made a disconcerting discovery. They thought they had solved their food problem. Floods and droughts that year showed them they were still at the mercy of nature. They found that the population of China was growing faster than its supply of food. In 1957, they launched an intensive campaign of birth control. It lasted for six months. Then it was abruptly abandoned. It had been a failure. Confronted with the crisis of too many people and not enough food, the communists had a choice. They could play it safe, cut back on their drive to industrialize China, concentrate on producing more food, or they could gamble. They could try to use their population as a weapon, mobilize it totally, try to increase industrial and agricultural production at the same time. They chose to gamble with the only stakes they have, the Chinese people. They go out among the people to launch what they call the Great Leap Forward. The leaders have been together for almost 40 years on the long march in the Yan'an Caves through the Civil War. 
Even their Russian allies find them arrogant in their self-assurance. They listen to no one. What other nations have done with time and money and machines, they decide China will do with the sheer weight of her manpower. A few miles outside Peking, they build a dam with their hands and feet, with wooden wheelbarrows. Everyone is expected to work at his regular job, his regular hours. Then he is expected to work at another job, on a dam, a road, a factory. 20 million build roads. They make their own tools, invent them as they go along. A few pumps and generators appear. There are no cranes to lift them, no trucks to transport them, only people. The methods are 50 centuries old. They were used to build the pyramids of Egypt. China is like a human ant heap, says one foreign observer. The communists set a target. In 15 years, they say, they will be a greater industrial power than Great Britain. Ceaselessly, the work goes on. Nothing is impossible, they say. Out of sheer mountain sides, they hack roads with shovels and picks and with their hands in the snow. The working day is 14 hours long. At night, there is time for political indoctrination. Those who resist are sent to labor camps to be re-educated. Most do not resist. The pace grows more frantic. Ceaselessly, without rest, one observer writes, even bigger masses are hurled into the battle. The countryside is in convulsion. The bottom of the Yangtze River is shifting sand. Western engineers have said a bridge cannot be built. Communist engineers say it can. The bridge is built. The first train crosses. The bridge holds. There is wild celebration. The barbarians are wrong, the communists say. Each new bridge, new dam, new road is hailed as bringing China closer to being a great world power again. Some of the projects fail. Roads crumble, dams break, but many hold. In the air, there is the emotional fervor of a nation at war. The imperialists threaten us, the communists cry. 40 million peasants are armed, some with wooden rifles. They march in labor brigades to work in the fields. The collectives give way to communes. The land now belongs to the commune. Members of the communes eat in common mess halls. Their children are sent to common nurseries. Two hours a day are set aside for political indoctrination. They get two days a month off. True communism, Peking says, is now close at hand. The peasants work for the government. They are told their loyalty is owed to the government. They are told the old biological family unit is obsolete. They own nothing. They are paid by the commune, mostly in food. What they produce belongs to the commune. Tractors appear, made in China, where once each peasant cultivated his stamp-sized plot of land with a wooden plow, tractors will now plow a thousand acres. But now there are only a few. There are fewer than 20,000 tractors in all of China. But some do exist. They are shown off to foreigners. 
This is the way it's going to be, say the communists. Everywhere, the communists report, production records are being broken. Those who doubted that agricultural production would keep up with population, says Chairman Lu Shoji, have been proved wrong. Three hundred seventy-five million tons of grain are said to have been harvested, almost twice as much as ever before. No area is immune to the great leap forward. In one commune, a mechanized waiter is devised that delivers a Chinese dinner by automation. Ten million peasants make steel in their spare time in backyard blast furnaces. To meet production quotas, hand railings and kitchen utensils are melted down. The furnaces are everywhere, flickering like glowworms from one end of the country to the other. Always nearby is the voice of the party, ceaselessly urging them, driving them to work harder, produce more. The Great Leap has started China on the road to industrial power. China has become one of the three great coal producers of the world, one of the half dozen great steel producers. In 1952, China produced less than two million tons of steel. In 1959, the communists say they are producing 11 million tons. In 1960, they say 18 million. Foreigners are shown modern generators. A modern cotton mill working two shifts a day, six days a week, with four holidays a year. Some foreigners remember cotton was China's great pre-war industry. Has the production of cotton for clothing been increased? The communist answer, there is still a shortage. Peking, 1959. This is a special year for the communists. They have been in power 10 years. The people look clean, well-fed. To a foreigner's eye, there is no sign of crisis. Peking begins to be sprayed and scrubbed down for the coming celebration. October 1st, Nikita Khrushchev arrives. He has just been with President Eisenhower at Camp David. He has been talking peaceful competition with the West. Mao greets his chief ally. Everyone of importance is present. But some observers think they detect distinct disapproval by the Chinese. One million Chinese parade before the communist leaders. Khrushchev speaks of the possibility of coexistence. The imperialists can be beaten, he says, without war. Zhou Enlai answers pointedly, China has found her own way of building socialism. He boasts production has been doubled. Industry has grown more in this one year than in the whole five-year plan. Khrushchev sees pictures of Engels, Marx, and Stalin everywhere. He sees no picture of Khrushchev. The men who came out of the Yenan caves 10 years ago look out on the revolution they have made. But as the celebration goes on, behind the scenes it becomes evident that something is wrong. Reports are heard of peasants collapsing from fatigue, of passive resistance, of production breakdowns. public display of military power is impressive. But behind the scenes, the leaders make some admissions. 1959 has been a record year, but steel production was not 11 million, but 8 million tons. Grain production was not 375 million, but 250 million tons. Later, experts say it was closer to 200 million tons. There is less meat less cotton, less shoe leather, fewer eggs. The backyard blast furnaces are being abandoned. The transportation system has suffered breakdowns from overstrain. The harvest has been bad. Many people are hungry.
The communist cadres have falsified production reports. Figures have to be revised downward. 1959 targets have to be cut back. Still, the marchers swarm past the reviewing stand. On the surface, the revolution is a huge, unqualified success with the complete support of the people. Behind the scenes, there is trouble. The communists admit that they have not yet created a new socialist man as they believe they have. It will take a long time to industrialize China. Communism is still a distant dream. As the celebration continues into the night, the men of the Yan'an Caves know their gamble has failed. The great leap forward now hangs in midair. Will China fall back or leap ahead? As the fireworks celebrating their first 10 years light up the Peking night, this is on the minds of all the leaders of the communist world. It is at this point that the wall of secrecy goes up and Western observers are barred from China.